Morning, church. Happy Thanksgiving. We love you more than you know, and we thank you for spending your Sunday morning here with us. If there's any room next to you, if you will please squeeze in a little bit. Um, I know we have a full house, it seems like, today. So if you just squeeze in a little bit, uh, I see that the seats front are filled, which is a sign that probably everything in the back is already filled. But this past Monday, I had the privilege of uh, picking up my friend and his wife from the airport. But before I left home, I went onto the airline website to check whether or not the flight was on time or whether or not the flight would be delayed. And if you use air travel, whether it's for work or for leisure, then you're familiar with the concept of flight delays. Jesus promised that he would return to earth. And his return would include judgment that would come upon the unbelieving world. But it's been more than 2,000 years. That's a long time. It's been more than 2,000 years since Jesus made this promise. His original followers during the times of the New Testament, they lived anticipating, waiting. When would he appear? When would his return arrive? It appears that the second coming has been delayed. But today we're going to see from our text, from our passage, that Jesus has not delayed his return by even a single second. Jesus will return right on time. His return is on course simply because God does not operate on our human timeline. God operates on an eternal divine timeline. So if you have God's word, please take it. And turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, where we will see Peter teach us this truth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. I'll give you a moment to turn there. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter continues to address the false teachers because the false teachers were denying the second coming of Christ. They were saying, look, Jesus has delayed what he promised would happen. Maybe, just maybe, he's not coming again. So the first truth that we see this morning, the first point that we see is that God operates on an eternal timeline, and we see this in verses 8 to 10. That's the first point on your handouts. God operates on an eternal timeline. Look now at verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Here Peter borrows from Psalm chapter 90, verse 4, where the psalmist contrasts, and the psalmist is making a contrast between the eternal nature of God Versus the finite nature of man. God is infinite. God is timeless. But man is finite. Man lives within the limitations of time. There are 24 hours in a day. But God is timeless and eternal. God exists outside of time. Because only a timeless God can set time and history into motion. Only a timeless God can write the pages in the course of history being his story. And so God is completely in control, and his timing is perfect. This is not saying, Peter is not saying that one 24-hour day is literally equal to a 100 years. That's not what Peter is saying. Peter is not saying that 24 hours is equal to a 1,000 years. Instead, Peter is simply using a metaphor. He's using a metaphor to give us a glimpse into God's eternality, into the eternal timeline of God, that what seems like, notice the words as, is as, what seems like a long time to you and me, what seems like a thousand years to us, is nothing more than one day to a timeless God, an eternal God. Peter's point of argument was simple. God has not delayed his judgment for one second. Even though in our human finite mindset, it seems like 
Jesus has delayed. Jesus is on time. He's on his timeline. It's different from ours. And he operates on an eternal timeline. Then in verse 9, then in verse 9, Peter gives us further insight into God's character. So we see God's eternality in verse 8. And then we see in verse 9, notice in verse 9, that God is not slow. On a human timeline, on our Google calendar, it seems like he's slow. To Jack Bauer, it seems like he's slow. Because Jack Bauer operates on a 24-hour timeline. But God's not slow. He's patient with sinners. And that's what we see in verse 9. That what seems like slowness is actually his character. His great character of patience and love. Notice verse 9 where Peter says this. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. As some count slowness, some being the false teachers, some being all the doubters who doubt that Jesus has delayed and he's not coming back. But instead, his character is one of patience. He is a God of loving kindness. He's a God of steadfast love. He's being patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The false teachers mistake God's patience for slowness. There's a specific goal for God's patience. So get this, God is not just sitting in heaven saying, well, I don't know. You know, I'll just come back whenever enough people repent. Well, when that's, when is that going to happen? That can happen forever. And then that would prove that he's never coming back. But instead, God has a divine timeline with a divine decree and divine purpose. And he is on course. God's patience has a goal. And what is that goal? Look very clearly in verse Verse 9, the goal is that all should reach repentance. Well, clearly and logically, the majority of the world rejects Jesus. The majority of the world in history has rejected Jesus. The majority of the world will continue to reject Jesus. The majority of the Middle East is anti-Christian and wants to kill Christians. So when is this going to be fulfilled that all should reach repentance. What is repentance? Repentance means a change of heart. Repentance refers to a complete change where Jesus changes our hearts and it leads to a changed life. Inward change that leads to outward display of godly character. Well, when that, when is that going to happen? So what is God waiting for? What he's waiting for is that God is completely in control. In 1 Peter, the letter that he previously wrote, he referred to his recipients as chosen by God. Then in 2 Peter, our very letter here, 2 Peter, in chapter 1, he exhorts the believers, make your calling and election sure. Say you're chosen by God. Well, do everything you can to make your calling and election sure. How do you do that? By living out godly virtue, because godly virtue is evidence that you've been chosen by God. And so what Peter is saying here is that God's patience is not subjective. God's patience has an object. And that objective goal is that everyone who he has planned to save will come to repentance in his divine timeline. Isn't it by God's grace that we are part of his plan? Because we didn't have to be. Isn't it purely by God's grace that this Thanksgiving we can say thank you, Jesus, because we were born your enemies, we deserve to be your enemies, but you have opened our eyes to the truth and you've given us a seat at your table. So God's patience has a a divine goal, and he knows each and every person who will respond to the gospel in his timeline. And so God is being patient with sinners, and he will come when his plan is complete. Secondly, God's judgment will take the world by surprise. Because the world does not believe in Jesus, because historically the world has not, and we believe because of history, The world will continue to reject Christ. The world will literally be surprised when God's judgment comes. Look at verse 10 where Peter says this. It says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. What is the day of the Lord? What is Peter referring to here in verse 10? He's referring to what the Old Testament prophets spoke of and prophesied, a day of judgment and a day of deliverance. The day of the Lord refers to when Jesus will return. And that is a day 
where God's judgment and eternal divine wrath will be poured out on unbelieving world. But for God's people, it is a day of deliverance. It is a day where God will deliver his people, vindicate his people from the persecuting world. It is a day where he will vindicate all those who have stood for righteousness. It is a day where glory will be proclaimed for Jesus Christ and the church. That is the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord will come like a thief. This is not saying that Jesus himself will come like a thief. It's not saying Jesus could come in a black beanie dressed up in a black jumpsuit. Although you can say that Jesus stole my heart. Ha ha. But truly, he will not come like a thief. Instead, again, this is a metaphor. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. What does that mean? That means you don't expect his coming. No one expects a thief to come. No one knows the day or hour when a thief is going to break in and steal your possessions in the same way. Jesus, when he returns, the world will be unsuspecting. It will be a complete surprise to them. Why would you look out and anticipate the second coming of Jesus if you don't even believe in his existence? If you don't even believe that he came to begin with, and if you don't believe that he's God, why would on earth would you look out for his return? It makes no sense to believe in his return when you don't believe in his initial coming. And that's why the world will be literally taken by surprise like a thief. And then it says in verse 10, the heavens will pass away with a roar. That's a strong, loud, deafening noise. A roar and the heavenly bodies, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. Some of your translations, it literally says that the elements will be burned up. The elements will be destroyed by intense heat. What are these elements? We believe, and Bible scholars believe, that the heavenly bodies and the elements refers to the atomic, the atomic components that make up our universe. The heavenly bodies then represents our physical universe. It will literally be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and all the works that are done on it will be exposed. At that time, Every good deed will be exposed. Every sinful deed will be exposed. And the only deed that will stand the test are those who claim the one deed of Jesus, meaning his perfect work on the cross where he paid the penalty for our sins. Now let me take a moment to address some of the Bible students in here. Some of you Bible students are like, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. What's Peter talking about with his eschatology? And eschatology is just a fancy word to mean the study of the end times and the order of events and how it will happen. You'll look at verse 10 and you will say, look, Jesus returns the day of the Lord and immediately we go into the new heavens and new earth. Well, haven't we been taught in Revelation 20 that there's supposed to be a a thousand years in between the day of the Lord, Jesus' coming, and the new heavens and new earth? But Peter seems to imply and to clearly teach that Jesus returns and then immediately the new heavens and new earth. So what happens to the millennium? Well, this is really easy to answer because Peter makes it very clear to us. Look back in verse 8. What does he say? He takes care of it for us. He says 1,000 years, literal years on earth, is like one day to an eternal and timeless God. Therefore, The day of the Lord refers to and includes his second coming and judgment, thousand year reign, and the ushering in of the new heavens and new earth. It's all one day of the Lord when you look at the eternal timeline of God. It's his day, and he's timeless. So there's no contradiction. So if you want to believe in a literal millennium, it's included in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord includes Once again, Jesus is coming in judgment. It includes the millennial kingdom where Jesus fulfills what Adam failed to do, where Jesus will reign on the earth for a thousand years, subjecting all and cultivating this world in a way where God intended to be. And when he's done, he'll hand the kingdom back to God and say, here you go, God, 1 Corinthians 15. And then we'll all move into the new heavens, new earth. It's all one day of the Lord. And so it's simple, and I don't know why Christians debate so much. 
God operates on an eternal timeline. And this leads to our second point this morning. Point number two, God's people, therefore, must live with an eternal perspective. You see, when we say, oh, it's been 2,000 years and he's not back yet. We're operating on a human perspective and a human timeline. But since our God is timeless, eternal, and holy, our God works on an eternal timeline. Therefore, God's people must live with an eternal perspective, not a human perspective. Look now at verses 11 and 12 where Peter says this. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming day of of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Some theologians say the day of the Lord is different from the day of God. I do not see that distinction. So the viewpoint that I take uh, is that the day of God and day of the Lord are one and the same. In verse 11, it's very clear that Peter is saying, since every material thing is going to burn up, and since everything in this physical universe is going to dissolve, how must we live? Notice there's a question. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? But this is not a question where you could even respond, well, I have an option. The fancy way to describe this is this is an interrogative with imperatival force for some of you nerds. This question is a question, it's posed as a question, but it is a question with imperatival command-like force, which means this is a command. He's saying we must, what sort of people must we be if we know this truth? In other words, how do you apply the second coming of Christ? If you really know it, if you really believe in it, then how must we live? The knowledge of Jesus' return leads to a default lifestyle that must be lived out. Meaning, if you really believe he's coming, then you're not going to just sit there waiting for it, but you're going to live out in holiness and godliness. That's what it means. An interrogative with imperatible force and why exegesis is important. Peter provides two applications. Today we have two built-in applications to the text. There are two applications. How must we live in light of the knowledge of his second coming? Number one, pursue holy living. We see this in verses 11 and 12. Pursue holy living. Holiness and godliness refers to character. Remember in chapter 1, Peter referred to the virtues of Christ. Be all the more fervent in making your calling and election sure by supplementing your faith with virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Make every effort to make your calling and election sure by practicing these godly virtues. These virtues display Christ-like character. And this was a direct response to the ungodliness, to the sensuality of the false teachers. Remember the false teachers? They indulged in sensuality. Holiness and godliness are the complete opposite of a sensual lifestyle. So Peter here eliminates any notions, any notion, since Jesus hasn't returned yet, we can live however we want. Now let me be clear, Peter is not saying if you work harder at becoming holy, if you just practice more religion, that you will be saved. That's not what he's saying. Peter's not teaching something by works. He's saying holy actions are the evidence of people who are already headed for heaven. Think about that. He's not saying you need to do good works to get into heaven. He's saying people who practice holiness and godliness are people who are already headed for heaven. Holiness and godliness are the marks, the signs, the evidences of people who are headed towards heaven. It's heavenly people on earth. It's people who are headed for heaven, but they start to take on the form of heaven. Heaven on earth represented in the church. Represented in Jesus' people. I want you to think of a building. The plans for the building are already set. 
The design is already in place. You know that in time the, the building will be fully completed and put up. But there's a process of construction. And over time, you see the building take shape and form until its completion. It's the same thing with the Christian life, only we are always under construction until we see Christ. We are always in process until we reach eternity. So if you've truly placed your faith in Jesus Christ, who in 1 Peter, Jesus referred to as the cornerstone, then you have built your life on the foundation of Jesus. And as you live your life, people should be able to look at you and they say, well, you're not perfect yet. The building's not done, but we can clearly see the blueprints laid out. We see the foundation. We see that you have connection with the cornerstone, Jesus. We begin to see the Christian life, the full life of holiness taking form in your life. And that's what Peter's saying. He's saying that those who have godliness and holiness are the marks of people who already have their way, path, paid for heaven. This is how Christianity works. You can have the assurance that you're headed for eternity because you have the eternal qualities of Christ-likeness now. They begin to take shape in your life. Thus, the first way to live with an eternal perspective is to focus on pursuing holy living. But the second application that he gives us, where does this truth show up in our lives? We know Jesus is returning. We know this entire earth is going to dissolve. And he's saying, you know this is going to happen. How ought you to live? Second application, well, anticipate eternity. Anticipate eternity. Look at verse 13 once again. In verse 13 of our passage, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, he says, but according to his promise, so again, according to God's word, you have faith in God's word, according to his promise, we're waiting, we're anticipating for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So the second way to live with an eternal perspective is to actually anticipate eternity. That's logical. An eternal perspective <laughs> anticipates eternity. The second way to live is to anticipate eternity. Anticipate what you know is going to happen. I know this is silly. But I believe the Lakers are a championship organization. And I, so I'm anticipating a championship. It's going to happen, I hope, before Jesus returns. Not one, not two, but we're going to have a few more. I just anticipate it because they're a championship organization. But there's another team in town, and they've never been a championship organization, and though I know, you know, we're, I don't anticipate that they're ever going to win anything. Look, you're on the winning team. Heaven is guaranteed. Jesus has proven he's victorious. He resurrected from the dead. So you must anticipate what's coming and live anticipating that championship. You live anticipating this is the quality of Jesus. He resurrected from the dead. Surely he's going to come back and everything he promised is going to happen because that's who he is. And that's what he promised for the church. Take your Bibles, keep a finger here and what is this new heavens and new earth? Turn to Revelation 21. Turn to Revelation 21. In Revelation 21 and 22, it gives us this glorious picture of the new heavens and the new earth. But I just only, I just want to look at a few verses to give you a glimpse of what Jesus, is, Jesus promises us and what we are supposed to anticipate and how that might apply to our practical struggles and trials in everyday living. Look at Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So this is different. This is not a, a recycled earth. I mean, you think about it, there's no more sea. This is completely different. And the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away. Look at verse 2. Then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, from God, prepared as a bride. Well, where does that come from? We know that the church is the bride of Christ, adorned for her husband. 
verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He dwelt with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Stop right there. Remember in the creation, God's created purpose in the Garden of Eden, there was no sin. Before Adam fell, there was no disease. There was no death. There were no tears. There was no murder. There was no crime. There was nothing to worry about but to serve God and to enjoy His presence. Why was the Garden of Eden paradise? It was paradise not because there was a garden. It was paradise because God's presence was there. God's presence dwelt with Adam. And that's how our lives were designed to be lived. We were designed and created to live in the direct presence with God. That's what it means to have a relationship with Him, and an unhindered relationship. No sin, no barrier between us and the eternal Creator and being. Perfect presence of God dwelling among men. But as soon as Adam sinned, what happened? He got casted out of the Garden of Eden, and actually that symbolizes being removed from the direct, immediate presence of God. And so once you're removed from the presence of God, what happens? Well, God is the source of all life, so you have death. The absence of God is death. The presence of God is life. You see that? Once you exit God's presence, you have sin, murder, Cain killed Abel, deception, strife. All the worries of the world, all the things that you and I worry about, it's because we don't have the direct presence of God. Now, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit, and that's a down payment. But when we get to heaven, it is the full presence of God again. And what happens? Now, go back. Go back to Revelation 21, and look at verse 3 again. And it says, The dwelling place of God is with man. We're once again in a new and improved and a better garden of Eden. It says, He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them. And because of His presence, there will be no more tears. Because of his presence, death shall be no more. Because of his presence, there shall be no mourning. Because of his presence, there will be no more crying. Because of his presence, there is no more pain. Because of his presence, the former things have passed away. And so when I think of the new garden, I don't think of a Chinese restaurant. I think of the new heavens and new earth. That's the new garden. Beloved. How does this apply to us? That means when you're struggling with disease and your body is decaying, you start to think, I anticipate not that my body will be completely healed or recovered in this earth, but I'm looking for something better. I want to be with Jesus in his presence where there will be no disease and pain. When you're emotionally depressed and you're down because of the course of this world, you think, I'm not looking for things to be happy in this world. But I am looking for happiness that is eternal, and I'm going to get there. That's the eternal perspective. That that you're able to take the trials of this world, but your mindset, you lift yourself into his word and out of this world into the eternal perspective of the new heavens and new earth. When you think of ISIS and what's happening, or the IS, or they keep changing their name uh, to match different types of Lexus vehicles. Okay, ISIS, IS, ISI, whatever. Islamic State, we'll call it, you know, and 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 they're 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 murdering Christians, and you're looking at eschatology, and you say, where is this? What does the Bible say about this? Well, the Bible says that we're not looking for an earthly kingdom now; we're looking for an eternal kingdom later. We're looking for Jesus to return, and when He returns, He will make things right, and and all these evil deeds will be exposed, and it will be vindicated that the people who give their lives for Jesus are truly the people of God and not those who claim God and murder people. That's what it means to anticipate eternity, to have a power and a mindset where you are lifted and anticipating the new heavens and the new earth. Now go back to 2 Peter chapter 3 where it says we are anticipating the new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. Well, we just explained in Revelation 21 what that righteousness is. We're talking about the righteousness of Christ. So when you're looking about, when you're looking at terrorism in this world, when you're looking at 
at, at murder in this world. When you're looking at sin in this world, your heart longs for righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ that we long for. We long for a place where Jesus dwells. We long for a day where all sin is removed because Jesus is there and Jesus cannot dwell among sin perfectly. And therefore, we needed him to go to the cross to die for us. And right now, Christianity is not perfect. We still struggle with But when we get to heaven and there's no more sin, that's where Jesus will perfectly dwell with us. Perfectly. Perfect presence. We must live with anticipation. When you order a new iPhone or Android, and I think it's funny because we, we long for these things, so we all know how to anticipate, but we don't anticipate his coming. Okay, when, when a new iPhone or Android device, you order it, or you apply for graduate school or college, and how many times do you check the mail or your email box? Or when, when you took a final and you know your professor's going to post the grades? You know, you're anticipating. I know when you're ordering a phone or a device, you're like checking the mail. You're checking the tracking number, right? On Amazon or UPS. You're like, did it come? Did it get lost? I hope I don't have to drive down to the dumb FedEx store to pick it up. Hopefully someone's at home when I pick it up. And you're just anticipating. You're waiting. You pay that extra postage for them to give you that thing, uh, that guaranteed shipping number thing. Uh, you know, when it's a, when it's a, when it's an application, you apply to a graduate school, you're checking the mail. Are they sending me anything? You're checking your email. So we know how to anticipate. That's what it means to live with anticipation. And you're always looking. Jesus, are you returning? Is today the day? Are you returning? Are you coming back? Just like you're checking the mail, just like you're checking your email. Just like you're, you're waiting for God to answer. You're like, God, is it today? And to live as if, Jesus, if you came back today, am I living out the life that you want me to live? And, and, and to live in anticipation means to pursue holiness and godliness. I'm not saying be paranoid. You know, when I was in college, uh, it was the year 2000. And I remember people were buying water like crazy. And that's probably why we have a drought now. You know, uh, but seriously, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, but, uh, you know, we have a drought because God hasn't given us rain. But, uh, you know, people were buying water like crazy. I'm like, are you flooding your garage or what? And everyone was like, what if the electricity goes out? Year 2000, you know, uh, Jesus might return. It's judgment day. It's doomsday. And I, And that's paranoid thinking. That's paranoid thinking. I'm not saying be paranoid. There are some people, you can Google this, not now, uh, but where where they believe 666 is actually www. www is 666 in the Hebrew. And they believe the World Wide Web is from Satan. Uh, there are some who follow the world events. And they, they try to look at the various world leaders and say, which one is the best potential for the Antichrist? Well, I think it's pretty clear. But, you know, which one is the best potential for the Antichrist? Well, we don't know who the Antichrist is until God reveals it to us. Peter's not saying be paranoid. He's not saying sit home, sit at home and fill up your garage with a bunch of water, buy tanks and get ready for Armageddon. He's not saying put on apocalyptic mode. Instead, he's saying study the word of God, know your eschatology and know that if you get your eschatology right, it means you will live lives of holiness and godliness, anticipating his coming, just like you're waiting for a package in the mail. He's saying, don't put all your eggs into a burning basket. That's what he's saying. He's saying, since you know all these things are going to dissolve anyway, invest in things that are eternal, but that requires an eternal perspective. Invest in people's lives. Invest in character, because if you invest in struggling with your anger or patience, when you get to heaven, you're going to be perfectly patient. So invest in what will be internal. When you invest in someone's life, whether it be your time, your resources, or your energy, discipling and mentoring people like Tony Firth did to me and did for so many others, the fruit of that life that you invest in is going to bear eternal ramifications. Invest in what is eternal because if you invest in what is physical and that's merely what you invest in, guess what? It's a burning basket and you're putting your eggs in it. That's what he's saying. If these things are going to dissolve anyways, Invest in what is eternal, holiness, godliness, and holiness and godliness in others. 
anticipate eternity. The central truth of this morning's message is God operates on an eternal timeline. Therefore, God's people must live with an eternal perspective. The two main points, that's basically the central truth. God operates on an eternal timeline. Therefore, if we're God's people, we must live and worship him with an eternal perspective. Now, obviously, if you don't have Jesus, then you can't have an eternal perspective. And if, if, you, have, if you don't have Jesus, then you are on his eternal timeline. But that means that judgment is being reserved for you. So once again, most of you, if you sit under our teaching long enough, you know where, where we're trying to go with every sermon. We need to go to the gospel. You cannot rightly apply any passage of scripture apart from a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, you know what, I've, I've been wrestling with this and that's why I'm here at church. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to receive him. I want to repent. I believe that Jesus came, that he died again, that he died and rose again. I believe, I, I want to confess my sins. I want to change. I want him to bring about repentance. If you want that, if you say, I want to surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you can do that right here, right now in your seats. God's doing that in your heart. Confess now and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And he will, and then live for him. Some of you, you're, you're here and you're like, oh, I haven't been to church in a while, but it's Thanksgiving, maybe I should go visit. And, and, and you're just walking and living apart from him. You're living as if you don't know him personally. And if that's you, God is patient towards you. He's not wanting any who, who profess him to, uh, to perish. He wants all to reach repentance. Pray that God will bring about repentance in your heart. Rededicate your life this morning. Say, Jesus, change my heart. Change my heart. It's not by coincidence that you're here this morning. And say, Jesus, I'm here this morning. I'm hearing your word. I see that it's true. I see the new heavens and new earth that's reserved for believers. I see judgment and condemnation and this whole fire and dissolving that's going to happen to this world. I want to dedicate my life to you. If that's you this morning, confess in your heart and ask the Lord to take over your life. And you can do that. And for the rest of us who are living for Christ, we so easily get entangled in the things of this world. We so easily get stressed out or put down, downcast by the things of this world. We must, if we are truly God's people, we must live with an eternal perspective because that is our God. He is an eternal God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this Thanksgiving thankful, thankful for Jesus, thankful that you've sent your son to rescue us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply the proper knowledge of your second coming and what's going to happen to this world. Lord, I pray that you would help us to first pursue holy living and then secondly to anticipate your second coming, to anticipate eternity. Give us an eternal perspective. If there's anyone in here this morning, who does not know you as, as their Lord and Savior, I pray that right now, as they're sitting in their seats, that your Holy Spirit would do his efficacious work and draw them to Jesus. That you right now would work in their hearts. And if that's you this morning, just follow me in this prayer. Jesus, we believe that you are the King. We believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. We believe you're coming again. And Lord, we pray, I pray, that you would save me. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of grace. I pray that you would bring about repentance in my life. And I pray as I surrender my life to your lordship, I pray that you would be my Lord, that you would be my God and King over every area of my life. Help me to do this. And if you pray that prayer, and if you need someone to talk to, you can come talk to me after the service. You can talk to one of, the, one of our ushers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.